I'm very happy to welcome you here. I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Campaign for Peace and Democracy, uh, which was instrumental in organizing the event, the AKNY Greece Solidarity Movement, Monthly Review Press, and the Marxist Education Project. Now I would like to introduce Tom Harrison, who is the other co-director of the Campaign for Peace and Democracy, who will introduce our speakers and chair the discussion. Thanks, Molly. This event is, is part of a book, book tour for Helena Sheehan, who's, who's sitting to my left. Um, Helena is a longtime activist on the left and a professor emerita at uh, Dublin City University, a professor of philosophy. Um, and um, she's American born. However, uh, she became an expat some 45 years ago and has lived mostly in Ireland ever since. Helena's book, over there. The Syriza Wave, Surging and Crashing with the Greek Left, is a wonderful title that vividly captures the feeling of extraordinary hope and elation that many of us experienced watching the rise of Syriza a few years ago, this new and, and seemingly unique political party of the radical left, followed by feelings of terrible betrayal and despair uh, as we witness Syriza's abject capitulation to the brutal austerity agenda of the bankers, precisely what Syriza had been elected to resist and defeat. So surging and crashing uh, really sums it up. Watching from abroad, of course, and even on visits to Greece, our anger and disappointment is nothing compared to the suffering and ruined lives of millions of Greeks who invested so much in Syriza. Whether or not you've been closely following uh, the modern Greek tragedy, this modern Greek tragedy, you should read Helena's book. Having been to Greece twice myself in the two weeks, uh, two years, sorry, before series that came to power, I found Helena's account of what it was like to be there amazingly evocative and true to my experience. The book is a, has, has riveting political drama, shrewd analysis, and a very appealing combination of the personal and the political. It's the adventures of a peripatetic observer who loves to swim in the sea uh, with, a, with a keen eye for poignant telling details, a readiness to enter into lengthy discussions in offices, cafes, and on sidewalks with Greeks from every walk of life, and apparently unlimited reserves of energy, patience, and sympathy. Helena is joined tonight by another brilliant analyst of Greek politics and society, Nantina Vgonsas. Nantina is a doctoral candidate in sociology at NYU and a member of the graduate student organizing committee here. I should add that Helena will be speaking on two panels at the left forum. One will be on Greece. Uh, the other one is titled, What Next for the European Left? Confronting the Challenge of Right-Wing Populism. Helena and Nantina will speak for 25 minutes each, after which we'll have discussion from the floor. Comments as well as questions are completely appropriate, uh, but please try to uh, limit yourselves to three minutes apiece. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, thank you all for coming and showing interest uh, in this. One thing um, about uh, launching a book or addressing a book is, you know, why did you write it? How did you come to write it? This was not a book that I planned to write. Um, I, I'm, I'm one of these very organized people who functions according to a plan, and uh, my plan for this period of my life, these, these uh, past years, um, was to write another book um, called Navigating the Zeitgeist. Um, I did get some time. I have made some progress on that book. My plans for just speeding head on writing this book that I've had welling up in me for years uh, were first derailed by the crisis, uh, primarily by the crisis that started in 2008. Although I've been politically active uh, my whole adult life. What I found was at this particular period where I thought, you know, maybe I could level out a bit and just be, you know, the odd body on the street and, you know, the sort of person wheeled out to give the odd talk or something like that. I found that uh, the crisis demanded a period of uh, intensified political activism. I had, for a start, just being the body on the street was, uh, I was called upon to do that very often. We had an increased level of protest, despite this caricature that Irish people didn't protest uh, throughout this crisis, which was never true. We'd never had as, as, as many um, or as uh, wide a range of 
forms of resistance as Greece, but who did? Uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I found that immediately, that the, the, the call of activism and organizing, I also had the sense that, you know, the Irish left needed to reconfigure itself. I was kind of preoccupied with the problem of um, the unaffiliated left and, you know, how to up our game uh, because of the crisis. Uh, and I also, because I'm a philosopher, um, I felt that, you know, I had to probe the meaning of this crisis in world historical terms. So I was naturally uh, preoccupied with the unfolding crisis in Ireland uh, and our political response to it on the Irish left. But the crisis made many people in Ireland, um, not just me, it made many of us look to Greece uh, where the crisis was at its sharpest. I felt that the, this was a global narrative which was playing out, but the story was a few episodes ahead in Greece. So as I saw the crisis at this stage, uh, I saw the crisis as caused by an instability in the global system, a system where the class interests of a parasitic elite determine the conditions of life for all of us, a system stabilizing itself by redistributing ever more power and wealth from below to above, experimenting on how far the state could be subordinated to the market, how much expropriation could be endured, how far accumulation by dispossession could go. So this process, which I saw as long underway in the third world, and then coming to what we call the second world, particularly from 1990 on, was now coming to the first world and playing itself out in this particularly intense way in Greece. So I saw Greece as the cutting edge, not only of the crisis, but a possible alternative. So I decided to go and to test my perceptions about Greece, uh, to feel the pulse of this society in crisis, to probe the possibilities of the movement, challenging these forces that were bearing down on all of us, and to align myself with this alternative. I wasn't a neutral observer. I sought to listen and to convey a wide range of positions, but I took a position myself and declared my loyalties. I rode the Syriza wave. Why Syriza? Because I felt that it synthesized the best of the old and new left, because it drew from Marxist intellectual and political traditions, but also from the newer social movements. From 2012, well, I didn't start going to Greece in 2012. I started in the early 90s, and um, I, I had some knowledge of the range of Greek political parties and followed Greek politics from a certain distance. But from 2012, I did this with a great intensity. Uh, between the general elections of May and June um, 2012, the whole world was watching Greece, not only the left, because it actually looked as if the left would win in Greece in that period between, and, 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 and immediately win. It looked as if Syriza could win the second election in, in 2012. So from 2012, I went to Greece many times. I built my network, I followed life stories, I had intense interactions, I marched, I was tear gassed, I spoke with Greek people in the streets, in offices, in homes, in conferences, in tavernas, especially in the tavernas. <laughs> and eventually in government ministries when friends of mine became ministers uh, in the series of government. I also beheld beautiful places, consumed lovely food and wine in warm and stimulating company. So in th there's a sort of travelogue element in this book as well as uh, <laughs> politics and theory. In fact, several people have told me you know, since they've read it, they're using it to plan their trips to Greece. <laughs> And, and they, they, they picked out people that were, that were the characters in my story they particularly liked and emailed me for their contact information. <laughs> so I decided from an early stage, not so much to write a book, but I decided that I could share my experiences because I had the freedom to, to go and do this and others who were also interested in this for the same reasons couldn't do that. 
I didn't originally intend to write a book, I, but I wrote an article uh, recounting my experiences and reflections, uh, which was published in Ireland, but it was republished in the US, uh, UK, Greece, Australia, and then it was translated into other languages. So, you know, there were, it, it showed how, how broad was the interest in all of this and how many people felt that there was something at stake in the story. So throughout this period, events kept moving. I often didn't know what would happen next. Uh, I often got up in the morning with a plan for the day that completely became derailed uh, as the day went on. There was one particular day in June 2013 where I had a plan for several meetings followed by a rather relaxing evening in a taverna. My first meeting went as planned, but after that, I was occupying a TV station all through the night and for the next three days, which definitely I hadn't planned to do. This occupation continued for two years. Now, I wasn't there all two years, but I, I, I followed it and, and was involved with it for those two years. So that's one of, definitely one of, the, uh, the, of my whole life uh, in, in seeing forms of uh, resistance and prefigurative projects. That two years of Eret was one of the most amazing things I've ever beheld. So in March 2014, I was involved in organizing the visit of Alexis Tsipras to Ireland. I was proud to introduce him to a public audience at my university. I wasn't so pleased at the bland speech that he gave which was devoid of class analysis of forces of history. I was not starstruck, but I was a critical yet committed supporter of Syriza. I saw and heard things that worried me, but I let hope prevail. In the heady days following the electoral victory of Syriza in 2015, my life was completely taken over by it. I could do little else by read all that was, but read all that else that was by reading. Sorry, I could do little else except read all that was being written, uh, respond to invitations to speak about Syriza in universities and communities and at political events, primarily in Ireland. At this time, Monthly Review Press asked me to write a book, and I declined. For the reason I, I declined in the first, because there was a mountain of writing about Greece during this time. Uh, by people who were better qualified to write about Greece than I was. They, they were Greek, they spoke Greek, they lived in Greece, and some of them were professors of economics, and I was none of those. I felt it, at that point, uh, people were still paying attention between July and September 2015, but I had a strong sense that that writing was going to stop, and that this, but I had a sense that the story didn't stop there, and, and that needed to be written, and I, I didn't think that other people were um, going to be doing that. That's when I agreed to, to write this book. Actually, I remember the moment I was, I was just talking to, to, I was just down at Monthly Review Press today and uh, talking to Martin Padio, and I, it, I was sitting, on, I was alone uh, one evening at the harbor in Rathimnon in Crete and just checking my phone. I'm pretty sort of obsessively wired up, wired up to the internet, and an email came asking me to consider again uh, would I write this book, and I, I sat there, it was during the election of September 2015, and I, said, I, I decided it very quickly that I was going to write this book. Uh, because I felt that uh, the, the, the writing that was being done until then was going to kind of let the story end. Do you remember when we were children, these storybooks used to end happily ever after? I thought that people were going to end this unhappily ever after, and then that would be the end of the story. Uh, but I decided I was going to uh, stay with the story. I was there as it climaxed and it crashed and the consequences unfolded. Everybody I knew was traumatized. I'm talking now about July uh, 2015, just when I met uh, Nantina uh, in Athens. Uh, everybody I knew was traumatized, I, as I was myself, and I decided that I would write my way through this trauma, uh, both theirs and mine, but of course primarily theirs. And so, uh, what was the story at that stage? I found that Syriza, which was once such a horizon of hope, was transforming into a vortex of despair. Many people from abroad were in Athens during those days in July 2015 uh, for this international conference, which uh, Nantina was there as well. 
which unfolded in a way that was very different from what was first planned. This unknown group had organized this conference and all kinds of people came because it was Athens in 2015 and it was a left government and it was where everybody wanted to be. We didn't see exactly what it would be at that stage because uh, things happened so fast. During that time, the government of Greece, in which we placed so much trust, was brutally defeated and then capitulated in its own defeat turning its fire on forces who would not consent to the capitulation. That's, uh, as well as signing the agreement, which was a bad enough thing, to actually, for Cyprus and others, to actually turn their fire on the left, um, who were criticizing that, more so than, than, than on the right. It's hard not to be bitter about that. And the bitter experience of, you know, I mean, you know, those of us who have been around and active for a while, you know, you're tear gas now and again, and it's, you know, it's the, the rhythm of, of, of activism. Uh, and I'd even been tear gassed in Syntagma Square before. But the, the bitter experience of being tear gassed by a government that we supported, it wasn't, you know, the tear gas, but it was, the, it was symbolically what, what, what that tear gassing of the left that night in Syntagma Square rep represented. That was something, you know, very difficult to get over. But beyond that, there was the betrayal of the people of Greece, who had so recently in the referendum shown such courageous defiance with such a resounding ochi. And this is the image on the cover of this book, the, the ochi. Even in Dublin, you know, we had thousands of people on the streets of Dublin that didn't even know the word ochi the week before, the day before the referendum. They, there were hundreds of Greek flags at all of our demonstrations in Dublin for those, those, those months of 2015. It, it just meant so much to, to so many people. And then there was the destruction of Ceres itself, so long and so carefully built, being so quickly and so carelessly demolished. The thing that calls itself Ceres and now is another thing. It, it's, 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 it's in continuity with the, the other thing. But it's, it's, it's not the series uh, which, which captured our imaginations. And then there was this following that. There was the, the, the scattering of all these forces that had gathered around Syriza. There was the escalating erosion of standards of, of living. And then the depression and the despair that followed all of this. So in my times in Greece during the crisis, I can divide this experience into two periods both before and after July 2015. During the first period, there was constant decline in material conditions, but there was resistance and there was hope. In the second period, material conditions continue to decline, but there's only weak resistance and little hope. In the six times that I've been there since July 2015, I've seen many people disengage. I've seen even the ones who are still coping and politically engaging more and more reduced. Their lives have flattened. Their hopes have diminished. Their depression has deepened. In those days of July 2015, there was shock, anger. There was energy to decide what to do. It was a terrible time, but I actually look back at that as a, that as a better time because there was this energy of coming to terms with it. And much of that has dwindled for the moment. The despair has deepened. My most recent trip to Greece last month was the most depressing of all. It wasn't that anything decisive happened. It was the lack of anything decisive, even on the horizon. That's not to say that there won't be something, but as people saw it, there was a kind of emptiness there. But meanwhile, the sun still shines. It remains stunningly beautiful on the surface. As ever, tourists can come and go without ever seeing any sign of how the society is unraveling around them. However, once you veer from the tourist trail, you can see it, even in such basic things as university buildings, public universities. They're in a shocking state the public universities, the public hospitals, the public institutions, even the state of the lavatories, a basic thing like that. You can just see it. Uh, if, if you're staying in a hotel in the private sector, everything is clean and there's everything there you need. And then you go to give a lecture in a university and it's falling apart. They're, they're just these everyday things, but are, they're constant and they're in everybody's life. Here's just one everyday example from when I was recently there. 
The mother of a friend of mine had a seizure and she needed an MRI. But the MRI in a, in a major Athens hospital had broken three years ago and there was no money to either repair or replace it. These are the things that aren't in, in, you know, that aren't in the headlines or not in the news, but these are the conditions of everyday life and everything like that is intensifying. In fact, uh, I got, uh, I, I was saying it to a few people since I came, this message just in the last week popped up on my mobile phone and it said, we are sinking, sinking, sinking. There seems to be no end, no bottom of it. And, and then he, I, we went back and forth texting and he said, you should write a second volume, the series of crime. And this is somebody who was a member of the Central Committee of Syriza until 2015. In, in ordinary conversations, they're just stories about the struggle to survive, both financially and psychologically. Now, there's another book covering um, these, these events. Um, this has been published more recently than mine, quite recently, it's this, this, just this month, by um, Yanis Varoufakis. Uh, it probably sold more in its first day than mine ever will. <laughs> The two books are on the same terrain. His is concentrated on events leading up to his becoming finance minister and the time he held that position. Um, as the international media both acclaimed and reviled his macroeconomic expertise, his chic lifestyle, and his unique blend of ingratiation and defiance of the masters of the universe with whom he negotiated. It's called Adults in the Room. And there's something smothering about reading the desolate details of those closed off rooms where the elite so callously and carelessly decide our fates. It's good that he's broken ranks and revealed what went on, even if it's not a satisfactory, satisfactory account. Other accounts from other perspectives will be necessary to form a picture of what happened and why. I've reflected a lot uh, about the possibilities and the perils of first person writing. The challenge is to see the eye in proportion to the rest of the world. And the danger is grotesque egocentrism. And I think this is the problem with the Varoufakis book. He projects himself as uh, Prometheus, where he, as he comes across to me as Narcissus. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course his role would be foregrounded in his telling of the story, especially because he played such a prominent role as these events unfolded. But everybody else's role is blurred, distorted, or even invisible. Other elite players, Tsipras, Dragosakis, Papa, Schäuble, Lagarde, Draghi, Summer, Sachs, Macron, play secondary roles. But series that barely exists. In fact, we, we were just talking about it. They actually shows contempt for series as a force in this book. The Greek left is nearly absent, and the Greek people are a blur in this book. But it's not only the people that are missing. Its forces of history disappear in this play of elite personalities. This is a lone ranger narrative, except that the good guys don't win. He does use the term class war at one point, but not in a way that comprehends that this is the core story that needs to be told. So I think my book, such limited as it is, is a counterweight to this. But I don't consider either mine or his to be a definitive account. And I hope there'll be many books coming at this, uh, because this was, is a crucial episode in the whole history of the international left. But I think that mine brings more voices and experiences into play and does attempt to deal with the balance of forces and the rhythms of history in a way that his doesn't. I also think that Varoufakis does not tell the full truth of what went on in July 2015, that he absented himself from Parliament and retreated to his villa on the island of Aina when the first crucial vote was taken. When the next vote was taken on a 977-page bill of oppressive measures that hardly anybody even had time to read that was dictated by the Troika, Varoufakis voted yes. On the final vote on the memorandum, he did finally vote no. So in this book, I've dealt in a lot of detail uh, with that particular month, that climactic month, and the whole spectrum of responses to that. And then I've tried to carry the story forward uh, a whole year after that. 
and I kept going. You know, when I started the, uh, this narrative, the whole world was watching, and then I kept going when the world was no longer watching. But I felt, felt that this story also needed to be told. This is a very personal account of my interactions and my, my reflections on Greece, but it's also about Ireland and Europe and, and even the wider uh, international uh, scene, because this was all I had to offer. Uh, to this. I don't, can't claim any uh, academic expertise in Hellenic culture or monetary economics. All I had was my sense of the rhythms of history as they flowed through me uh, during this time. So um, it, it combines a kind of diaristic narrative um, with dimensions of political reportage, travel log, theoretical analysis, personal reflection, and philosophical polemic. And it's been quite a ride. Uh, for all of us. Uh, Paul Murphy, uh, who's an Irish uh, member of parliament, says in the thing that it's been a roller coaster. Whatever image captures it, uh, mine of a, a surging and crashing wave, uh, it's been very much a high drama, very much in the genre of tragedy in this land that gave birth to bo both the word and the genre of tragedy. So my chapter headings basically uh, tell the story in, in stark summary almost winning, preparing for power, a holding pattern, fighting Goliath, dealing with defeat, talking left, walking right. So that's the plot. David fought Goliath, Goliath won, David lay bleeding. Or alternately, alternatively, Sisyphus rolled the rock up the hill, the rolled rock down and inflicted serious injuries. Sisyphus struggled to find the energy and courage to mount the hill again. So I've done my best with the difficult part of the story um, to deal with the dynamics of defeat. Uh, at, at one point, maybe it was at that conference in Athens, some younger leftist got up and referred to my generation as uh, having the habit of defeat. We, we do, we, we've been defeated many times, but it's not as if we didn't set out to win. <laughs> You know, and so maybe they've learned that, you know, or they've set out to win and nearly won. And, 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 but it, it's, it, it, this is part of life on the left, you know. Uh, it's not happily ever after. It's, it's necessary um, to cope with defeat. Um, so that's, that's another thing I brought to bear on this, the habit of defeat. But it's been a defeat not only for, for Greece and the Greek left, but way beyond that. I don't think a lot of Greeks really understand, you know, uh, how affected that the whole international left, and even, even a lot, many, many people beyond the left, how deeply they've been affected by this. How it's strangled hopes, how it's pulverized prospects, how it's constricted horizons. And, and these days, and, and I think this is a problem for anybody, to, you know, for a monthly review trying to sell my book, is that, you know, Greece, uh, Greece is not hot the way it was uh, two years ago. It makes only marginal appearances on the international news. Every once in a while it pops up and there's this new drama with each review to release each new tranche of, of the so-called bailout money. Series again says, no, 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 and then they say yes. And then there are these promises of debt relief that are never fulfilled. And this goes over and on, over and over and over. It's a kind of dance of death. And meanwhile, everything is worse, not only the material conditions, but the absence of hope. There is still resistance. There was recently uh, another general strike, tens of thousands, uh, protesting outside parliament. Others, again, throwing the Molotov cocktails. All the protesters getting tear gassed as the MPs inside Parliament are saying how awful all these things are, and then they vote for it anyway, over and over and over, this cycle continues. Nevertheless, people tell me, and, and I believe this, that it cannot go on like this. Uh, something will happen. People, a number of people might ask, something will happen. They don't know what or when, whether it will even be good or bad, but something will happen. Then maybe, you know, people will start, if it's dramatic enough, then people, some people might start paying attention and it'll be on the international news agenda. But it's true, I mean, with the, in, the international news agenda, it's very fickle, but at the same time, there are very real things that, that are preoccupying people. The Trump presidency, Brexit, and, and you know, people can't maintain that level of, of constancy with uh, attention to Greece. But nevertheless, I think there is still much to demand our attention here as well as elsewhere, uh, because the Greek tragedy and people are forgetting it is still ongoing and, and still deserves attention. So I hope that my book can play some role in, in giving it that attention. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you all for being here, uh, to the organizers of this event, and to Helena for asking me to discuss your book. Um, I feel very honored to do so. It was actually a real treat to read your book. Um, you can tell just from her brief comments about Varoufakis that she pulls no punches. Um, and uh, one thing I have to say with the critiques that she does end up making in the book is that they're very fair and that she is one to constantly be considering other perspectives. And indeed, it's not just that she sits, situates her account and analysis in um, these you know, various protests um, and pickets and meetings um, and gatherings that she attended, uh, but you can tell that she herself was constantly assessing her own perspective um, throughout this process. I think that's why, you know, she ended up, I think, standing out as one of the few um, intellectuals outside of Greece um, who had actually aligned not just with Syriza, but with Sidnas um, the, you know, ruling faction within Syriza. She went from that position to somebody who was actually critical of Sinas Bismos, critical of her friends within it, and to their faces actually, uh, which is commendable. To their faces and then ultimately, right, in this book form. I imagine that you yourself probably came under various types of critique, um, which likely weren't as generous as you often are with those with whom you disagree. Um, and so that was, as a writer and as an analyst, something that um, I learned to do through your book, uh, or hopefully uh, something that I can apply. So I titled this talk, uh, Walking the Road. That's because it's actually a line that comes up several times in the book. It's a line from the poet uh, Antonio Machado. Um, and it's a line that was repeated. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, I'm going to have to do this. Yeah, it's a line um, that was repeated by um, various of her interlocutors, um, two of whom are featured right here. Um, the guy at the top, um, uh, Baltas, um, he uh, is also a philosopher um, who ended up being um, first the Minister of Education um, in the first tenure of Syriza, um, and then ended up um, being a Minister of Culture. Um, the guy below him, uh, Michalis Burdalaikis, um, is a founding member of Syriza, um, and someone who I imagine you had known for over a decade. Yeah, okay, but uh, for some time. I had first heard of um, Professor Skurdalaikis from um, young people who I had met um, while I did kind of the parallel of what Helena was doing. That's because you know, he was somebody, an intellectual within the party um, and as a director of their think tank um, who really influenced um, the youth wing. Um, and just based on you know, my interactions um, with those younger comrades, somebody who was able to move them on a various um, sets of ideas. And I remember one of my comrades was telling me that, um, you know, back in the mid 2000s, um, Michalis had come to them to a meeting and he was like, you know, there's something happening um, in Latin America. It's called the pink tide and we must learn from it. Um, this is the left, you know, that we want to learn from because it's the left that has taken state power. Um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union and that is trying to implement some kinds of uh, redistribution. Um, and uh, I think, you know, that embodies um, the kind of um, approach that uh, people within Syriza had through the 2000s um, to learn from these traditions um, and to understand that they were remaking the left, um, you know, even though the Greek left had survived um, 89 more than other lefts, it itself was depleted um, of its capacities and fragmented. Um, and, you know, Syriza represented a current that wanted to engage with the emerging movements 
um, and to build itself and to you know, make the road by walking in them. Um, and so I thought that that was uh, you know, a, a good theme that ran through the book. Um, Helena herself right, also <laughs> walked the road. Um, and you know, she's already discussed in various ways um, how she tried to um, you know, locate her personal interactions within the broader narrative of Syriza and indeed um, the global left in this period. Um, and she kind of um, ends up summarizing it, uh, her own approach midway through the book when she's actually discussing and reflecting on that conference that we both attended in Athens in July 2015. And she's kind of reflecting on some of the presentations um, that weren't so grounded um, and that it didn't actually engage um, with the politics of the time. Uh, so I'm just going to read the quote, which feels a little weird being right next to the author, uh, but I don't want to put you on the spot reading your work, so I'll just go ahead and read it. I had long ago adopted a participational theory of truth and believed that activism was epistemologically important in how I think and write. It is not only a matter of knowing things we would not know otherwise, but it is a way of knowing what cannot be known in another way. There is a way of speaking and writing about political subjectivity, about concepts such as the people, the movement, or the party, that just does not have traction with those who have a more concrete experience of them. I'm going to uh, compliment um, the remarks that you gave, um, which you know, really, I think, give everyone here a sense of what the book is like with a, a, the kind of thing that I um, tend to do, which is a more of the analysis um, that is not as much rooted um, or that is not as transparently rooted um, in the um, experiences that I have had on the left. Um, and so the you know, key question that I'm going to pose um, and that I'm going to initially answer and that I would then like you know, Helena to um, give her own response to is you know, how did this party right, um, that you know, move through the movements, you know, we can date from the anti-war movements of the 2000s into the 2008 youth mobilizations that were triggered by the police murder of Alexis Rigoropoulos um, through to the reconstitution of the left between 2008 to 2010 <coughs> so that when we saw the mass mobilizations with the um, signing of the first memorandum in 2010, um, we saw the left um, you know, start to seriously engage um, and in fact um, be able to integrate itself into popular movements um, in ways that we haven't uh, seen in other contexts, right? And this is from the 2011 occupation of Sidagma Square. Um, where you know sectors of the left were able, you know, despite initial hesitation um, from you know various movement participants, uh, to uh, move people um, and to gain their trust, um, and right, and you know we can go on and on about uh, the expansion of the movement um, into different kinds of. Um, struggles, you know, here's the port struggle against the privatization in Piraeus. Um, here's the, uh, the union struggle of um, uh, cleaning workers at the finance ministry who occupied the finance ministry and who Syriza supported for some time. To even, you know, um, ex expansion into rural areas, um, you know, which uh, are known to be hubs of political activity, um, not since at least um, you know, uh, the resistance and the civil war that followed. Um, but you know, uh, this was a period where basically wherever you turned in Greece, people were struggling. Here people are struggling against um, the construction of a, um, of a gold mine in northern Greece. Um, and you know, the inclusion of um, you know, people who we hadn't seen participate in struggles in a long time, including pensioners and here you know, even a cleric. Um, so, right, that's the, the road um, to power that Syriza, by walking that road, was able to um, become a, a representative, a political representative of those movements. Um, very quickly, um, you know, uh, they transformed that 
into the road to defeat. And I'm just kidding. That's actually the <laughs> the the photo from the negotiations. I just thought this was funny. It was um, weirdly uh, from an interview that um, I guess this like teenage band did with Alexis Tsipras in 2008, um, soon before he became the, the leader of um, of Syriza. But I thought it was a weirdly um, symbolic photo because um, you know when people talked about his negotiations with um, Hollande and uh, oops with a land, I'm sorry, with a uh, Merkel um, through, you know, supposedly a land's assistance. Um, there was all this talk about him being, you know, psychologically tortured. In fact, people kept repeating that over and over that, you know, like 17 hour marathon um, where he emerged as a tortured person. So I just included that photo. Um, but, right, um, to answer the road to power and the road to defeat that question. I think the key thread is that what brought Syriza to power, the mobilizations, um, are what it not just eschewed, um, but actively um, limited um, in mobilizing toward its own leverage in its negotiations with the creditors. Um, and this is not something that's unique to the post-1989 um, period. Um, Helena herself actually invoked the ANC um, the, in South Africa, which failed to achieve or even approximate the society that those who fought and died for it set out to achieve. Um, so what I'm going to try to do, and it's a bit ambitious, and I'm sure I'm going to go over time, so I might have to stop three quarters into it, is to try to cluster the experience of Syriza um, with that of the ANC um, and you know, another uh, social democratic attempt, we might say, in Brazil uh, with the experience of the Workers' Party. Um, and to ask why those parties um, demobilized their bases prior to institutionalizing their power, uh, which is in contrast to what we saw happen with earlier periods of social democratic governance. Um, so you know that's gonna that's gonna be the um, the attempt. We'll see what I'll be able to do. But before I get to that, I, I just want to kind of um, you know echo the spirit of the book and talk a little bit about uh, my own coming to the story. Um, so I'm glad that you talked about the Ed occupation um, because for me also it was a highlight um, of that year that I spent um, in Greece uh, between 2012 and 2013. And it was a highlight in various respects. I have to tell you, this was after living there for about 10 months at that point. Um, and at the time I was working um, for uh, a newspaper. Um, I was kind of a digital media worker. And um, I hadn't been paid for several months, and that's a very common experience in Greece. Um, people now go often not being paid, not just for months, but even years. I ended up um, trying to figure out how to mobilize in that situation um, by going not to the newspaper journalist union, um, because I couldn't qualify as a member, as somebody who was um, being paid um, you know, as like an independent contractor, uh, but through actually an anarcho-syndicalist um, uh, workers' assembly, um, which was called Catalipsi SEA, um, which is actually means um, the occupation of the journalist union, and uh, that had begun for some time um, in 2008 during the youth mobilizations. Um, so anyway, I would go weekly to these meetings um, for several months by that point. Um, I would spend, since it was a Greek meeting, probably four or five hours every night, and then maybe an additional two hours drinking wine after. You know, this is something that I um, had a, a serious commitment to for a while. Um, and uh, the irony is that when we heard at noon, um, you know, in June, that they were going to, that the new democracy government was going to um, discontinue and effectively close the public broadcaster within 12 hours. Um, even I, as somebody who was, 
you know, organizing literally around media worker issues, um, given basically the lapse in movement activity throughout that year, the rise of the far right, um, which you could feel very palpably, uh, did not feel um, very hopeful um, about people turning out um, to defend uh, Ed. Um, and so I remember getting a call from one of my comrades from the assembly and they're like, oh, well, you know, we're not going to hold the assembly today. We're just all going to go to um, Ed, which, by the way, um, is unique in and of itself for anarchists who were largely very critical of public broadcaster to say, no, we're going to go and defend it. Um, so you know, I was like, really, guys, do you think this is actually going to turn to something? They're like, ah, we think so, maybe. And I was like, I don't know. Um, so, you know, I kind of stalled and went to a friend's place. Um, and then by 9 p.m., you know, we were hearing that there were tens of thousands of people um, inside and outside the premises um, while the workers had occupied it. Um, and so, you know, obviously we went there. We ended up um, staying there overnight. And um, this specific anarcho-syndicalist assembly actually stayed there throughout the duration of the occupation. And these, again, are people who were um, largely critical um, of the public broadcaster, but they knew that the struggle, you know, was about defending, um, you know, public goods against uh, the rights, you know, utter assault on them. So I actually want to also play you a clip from this um, from this time. Everyone singing, you know, and, and clapping. The Syriza flags next to Andalusia flags and PAME, which is the Union Confederation of the KKE, all together. And me, you know, with my anarcho-syndicalist comrades as well, you know, all um, coming together to support the workers and their occupation. Something that I think showed, uh, you know, where people could go in struggle, how the struggle could in fact be advanced. At the time, you know, I, I didn't quite realize how significant that was, um, but I think, you know, in understanding the Greek left more um, and understanding, you know, the various hostilities um, and how those hostilities in some moments actively actually um, kept the struggle at bay, um, you know, it, it was moments like these that I felt that, okay, um, you know, if um, the stakes are raised higher, um, the left, you know, might be able to rise to the challenge. For instance, if the OHI vote were actually followed through. Um, and this is, again, something that we did see um, in the week leading up to it, forces of the left again coming together. Um, even if they were skeptical of the cities of leadership's intention to carry out that vote, um, still coming together because they knew that the stakes were higher. Um, and uh, in any case, I just wanted to bring that up to kind of um, talk a bit about uh, the, the despair that I actually felt through that year. Um, a year in which we had expected um, the struggle to be enhanced. Um, by Syriza's becoming the opposition party in 2012. But in fact, it was, um, uh, there was a lull in that struggle that I relate um, quite directly to Syriza's strategy of demobilization. Enough of the political on my end. I want to you know, get to the question at hand um, and to situate um, the experience of um, you know, more contemporary social democratic attempts within uh, the history of social democracy. Um, so the first point to make about interwar and post-war compromise was that the impetus for it was mass disruptive struggle on the part of non-elites who were able to impose disruption costs that outweighed concession costs. And thus, elites looking to de-escalate the conflict agreed to a set of redistributive reforms. You know, that's the basic definition of a class compromise. In exchange, non-elite leaders demobilized their base, but only after institutionalizing their power to some degree. This corporate arrangement gave elites some leverage against a retrenchment, I'm sorry, gave non-elites uh, some leverage against a retrenchment of the gains that they had 
previously secured. So again, the key um, divergence between this period and the one after is that here they still demobilized, but they did that only after they achieved some institutional power for the left and for the workers' movement. Um, but because elites had retained control over the investment function, the post-war compromise was ultimately subject to profit constraints. And thus, amid declining profit rates in the 1970s, elites became actively intolerant of the political power afforded to non-elites. From the Thatcherite offensive and Mitterrand new turn of the 1980s to the third wave policies of Blair and Schroeder in the 90s, both sides of the political center moved decisively to the right. And the result, of course, was a nearly universal adoption of neoliberal policies and ultimately a hollowing out of social democracy. All right, so um, yeah, I am quite behind with technical difficulties and all, but I'm just going to give you kind of a, a framework of um, you know, what I think my answer to this question might be. And again, you know, I, I'd like to hear your analysis in response to that. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll kind of go a little more quickly than I anticipated through this um, to set up now the comparison Right. In this context of retrenchment um, and defeat you know, that Helena has already characterized, um, we've seen the emergence um, of workers' parties that have attempted to take state power um, in order to um, you know, pass even some modest measures. Um, and, oops, okay. Uh, like their predecessors, um, these parties were also based on mass mobilizations, um, the difference, however, being that they um, demobilized without institutionalizing the power of their base. Um, and uh, for me, um, this is why these parties have been um, thus vulnerable, um, not just to neoliberal retrenchment, um, but also as you know, in the case of um, Brazil last year, and increasingly in South Africa, uh, to the return of the right. Um, and I think, to be honest, uh, Syriza you know, could have a similar fate. Um, we don't know, um, you know, when and how that might happen because the right has been so discredited in Greece. Uh, but it's a possibility, given that my assessment is they're not going to actually get the debt reduction. So the question is why? Why have these parties demobilized without institutionalizing their power? Um, now I'm going to quickly go through the kinds of explanations that we often hear, um, each of which I think um, have some merit, but I think um, just need to be reinforced. Um, you know, the first often deals with the um, dynamics of a leadership um, that is able to basically sideline um, you know, the left wing of the party um, and then, you know, carry on what they want to do. And uh, Varoufakis, you know, story basically is that account. He, um, as you'll see um, a couple slides down from now, talks about um, basically uh, the Euro question, um, which ended up being so central um, to Syriza's uh, defeat as something that was just, um, you know, of issue to Tsipras because it, uh, you know, was being brought to the fore by feuding factions and that those factions were a distraction to what really needed to be done. Um, so in that account you can see um, him and potentially other leaders who, you know, just wanted to do away um, with, these, uh, with these factions. Um, you know, a, a second account um, asks, well, why is it that consistently social democratic leaders have um, ended up sidelining their bases. Um, and they point to right, the more structural constraints um, that exist, including right, the power of capital to disinvest from the economy if these parties end up doing something that's going to threaten um, its interest or agenda. Um, and in this scenario, right, the compromise is reached because neither side is able um, to basically sustain escalated conflict. Um, a third account, which is less common on the left, um, is 
one that treats the compromise not uh, as an outcome of negative sum, but one of actually positive sum, in which um, demobilizing and institutionalizing non-elite power can facilitate actually more efficient um, capitalist production and organization. Um, but given that we continue to have mass inefficiencies in the market, we need to ask why we haven't thus seen an attendant corporatism um, in today's workers' parties. Um, it's either that working class power no longer can resolve these inefficiencies, or the basis on which elites agree to reforms isn't primarily one of benefit. Um, I'd argue if you go to, for instance, um, the port of New York, New Jersey, where they're quickly um, you know, scrambling to expand it um, so that they can fit these mega ships through, um, which is something that they should have been doing for at least a decade. Um, it is an indication that um, you know, capital isn't just resolving its problems on its own, and that it in fact um, is like it's you know not even to say public goods; its own um, profits are actually being um, uh, inhibited um, by not you know using the state to facilitate that. Um, so, in that uh, sense, I think that we can reject the first premise and accept. Um, as a basic rule, um, that reforms are passed not when they benefit elites, um, but in fact when elites have no choice but to tolerate them. Um, so it's based on this assumption that I'm just going to present this and I'm not going to be able to substantiate it um, since I don't have time, uh, but I now you know, would be interested to get your thoughts on this. I'm going to argue that um, at this uh, conjuncture, that we're in, the scope of reforms that are tolerated by the most powerful sector of elites is the key determinant of the scope of mobilizations required on the part of non-elites. So during the post-war boom um, and reconstruction of national economies, production imperatives compelled industrial elites to settle quickly and accept um, some modicum of institutionalized non-elite power. But this framework has proven obsolete amid a global decline in output and the rise of finance as the key sector. Um, the logic of accumulation for financial elites dictated not by long-term investment, but quick turns of profits, puts them in the position of waiting out conflicts and moreover threatening the well-being of an entire country's banking system. So, Basically, the upshot is they don't have to tolerate um, institutionalized non-elite power as quickly. Absent the corporate option, social democratic leaders like the ANC, like um, the PT in Brazil, like Syriza, are left with either escalating their conflict or demobilizing their base. And my assessment is that these leaders themselves have assessed that they can't sustain um, that kind of escalation, that kind of all-out war. So instead they end up abdicating their agenda. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to take up too much more time, so I'm, I won't be able to substantiate here the claims. Um, but I just wanted to put it out there you know, as something that might be able to um, expand the discussion um, and historically situate um, Syriza uh, and to draw, you know, potential lessons um, for um, leftists um, in Europe and elsewhere uh, who, you know, still believe that there is um, a point to taking state power, um, but that, but who now are keenly aware of the many constraints upon them in doing so. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm just going to have to kind of leave it at that. I'm, if you want, I can just quickly um, elaborate on how this actually played out in the Greek case. The, the key point um, is that the leadership of Syriza had assessed um, that exiting the Eurozone risked a banking implosion and would have required an alternative growth model. Um, for them, that model was not possible. They lacked both the productive 
and the political forces to sustain it. And so um, they knew from the get-go that they weren't going to get everything they wanted, but that that was better than risking everything. You'll have to end up reading Varoufakis' book. Um, but you know, this is the conversation that he had when he first met Tsipras. Um, and Tsipras, he says at the time, in 2011, was still um, flirting with the idea of Grexit, perhaps even just as a bargaining chip. Um, and you know, Varoufakis um, explained to him, uh, basically, um, that there were three options. Um, one would have been to, um, to right, get the New Deal, uh, to get the honorable compromise, and that would have been the best outcome. The worst outcome would have been to stay in the Euro and to have the same situation, which is actually the outcome that they ended up with. And the one in between actually would have been a Grexit, which you said would have been worse than a viable deal within the Eurozone, but in the long term, much better. Um, so basically, they bet, and they betted on uh, the, the first outcome. And that unfortunately, um, didn't work out for them. Um, and, you know, you, unfortunately, maybe we can talk about this in the conversation, or you have to read the book, you'll have to see um, that in his account, um, he really has no consideration um, for the democratic processes within Syriza that would have enabled to have an, a, a real um, debate over the question of the Euro. And to think through, um, you know, the political economy um, of Greece, um, both uh, of its domestic balance of class forces and also of um, its relationship um, to you know, its creditors um, and the interests that they represented. Um, right? This is the kind of thing that was started to be done within the left platform um, through the inclusion right, of economists like Lapavitsas. And I think that um, had that debate basically been expanded um, into the party and, and not sidelined, by its leadership, people would have been able to think through these questions on an even deeper level and to provide the kinds of answers um, that very easily the right wing of the party said uh, weren't being provided because people hadn't worked out the details. Um, and that for me is actually kind of the conclusion um, of Syriza um, and you know, of, of what it would mean to have a healthy left, which is one that, you know, as you pointed out, um, you know, takes the, you know, the best of the historical traditions, um, but most importantly, that maintains the space for democratic debate so that people can actually think through um, the key questions um, that are going to ensure whether this party um, is going to be able to not just come up with an alternative, but sustain it. And, you know, to the extent that um, there's relevance of the Syriza story for our context, I think it really is just that very simple point um, that democratic deliberation actually does um, deepen um, our own analysis of the situation and um, gives us the room for coming up with the solutions um, that are actually uh, going to take us in the next step of the struggle as opposed to leaving them um, to you know, people who come up with uh, these ideas in closed off rooms. And so in that sense, I think your book is a key contribution because it touches on um, the kinds of things that people were thinking about at the time um, across various levels of the party, ranging from you know, the kinds of characters who I just you know, referred to, but also to the kinds of people who you met at the pickets, at the demonstrations, and that, all this kind of thing. Um, so uh, I'm sorry for taking up uh, time and for the technical difficulties, but I look forward to us you know, getting into this in the discussion. Well, Nantina, um, if I understood you correctly, you, you were saying that people like Tsipras assessed that they couldn't sustain an alternative. And I guess I would just venture to say they were wrong. I mean, they were wrong at least not to try. I, I can't guarantee that it would have worked, but the power of that vote in the referendum, the Ochi vote, 
indicated that there was a potential to do exactly what you're saying, that is to, uh, to, to tell the Troika and the powers that be, no, we won't do these things, and to tell people honestly, as I think they should have done before, that this might lead to being kicked out of the Euro. I don't think that they should have proposed leaving the Euro and the Euro, but they should say defiance, no cutting pensions, no privatization, none to, no to all of these things, and, edu and then start a democratic debate about what will you do if it doesn't work. And then if, it, if you are, if the, if the Troika is itself defiant, come back for another referendum perhaps to, but I think that this idea of democratic debate actually expanding possibilities of what can really happen is, is very important and I think both of you have, have correctly emphasized that. I have a question for both of you. Um, first, uh, with Helen, um, you mentioned, or Helena, you mentioned the um, the trauma of the Greek left in Syriza, and it very much reminds me of the trauma of the Arab Spring in the Egyptian context, where um, I've spent years doing research there, and the arc of 2011 and its hope, um, and particularly going to Tahrir Square and seeing people occupy it, but then with 2012, 13, in particular 2013, um, being a turning point with the anti-protest laws, the coup, et cetera, um, and you know, it, and that leading even to today, um, talking to some comrades who are there right now, uh, Madh Masar, the one progressive online newspaper in Egypt, has been banned in Egypt, so you can't even go online and see it <laughs> on, on, on a web page. And other things are happening um, to further censorship. Um, so just wondering uh, uh, to what extent um, the kind of the rise of counter-revolutionary forces that um, are were, are happening in um, the Egyptian context and how that trauma and failure in some ways is across the Mediterranean dovetails with the, the trauma and failures in the Greece context and then uh, more broadly um, what do both of you have to say about how um, the, the steps it would take to, to, to kind of build a left whereby the unaffiliated, those who are now newly radicalized, could suddenly perhaps be the seeds or the kind of um, foundation for something that is progressive and part of a broader based leftist party uh, that could serve as an alternative to the Democratic Party here in the US and how you see that happening, especially since that took you know, de you know, a series of years and decades in the, the Greek context and perhaps um, if y'all can offer any kind of insight on that. First to Nantina, which was a very rich and, and um, a rich presentation full of further possibilities. I'd like to know a lot more about her thinking about that. Um, I think that she's right to identify the process of demobilization of the movement itself as a key factor in all of this. Um, and, uh, and to bring the ANC in, 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 into that as well. This is a, a, a pattern that's repeated itself, and these are the two instances where I've seen it really close up. Um, but I think that, um, I think the, 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 the question you ask, if I understand it, um, it's a, a fairly complicated question, but I think we have to look at the, the power of the global movement itself. Um, and how it operates, um, both in terms of seduction and coercion at the same time. Um, not only the way it, it, it um, harnesses resources, but the psychosocial effect of how it deals with these leaders. Uh, Mandela went to Davos and was convinced, after all those years in prison, was convinced there is no alternative. Uh, and there's just the whole dynamic when they, they interact, the masters of the universe interact in these rooms and the leaders of our movement who are there because of you know, all these people on the streets, on, on your slides. Um, they're there through the dynamics of that movement and they go into these rooms and they interact with the masters of the universe as one of them and, and they increasingly lose touch. But the, the, that's the dynamic in the global system itself and, and how does, I think the answer has to be in, in building movements that continue to refuse to be demobilized. I think that's the main thing we have to think about as people involved in, in these movements. And, and the same um, with, with, with your question, um, that these were fantastic uh, uprisings 
uh, people that had never been mobilized before coming together with people that had been mobilized for decades. This fantastic interaction, I mean, we saw it here, um, well, in, in, in certainly in New York with Occupy Wall Street, in Dublin, we occupied Dublin. Uh, this was a really global thing in 2011, and what's come of it? Something has come of it. I'm not say, I, don't, I don't think nothing has come of that. Um, but it's it, a lot of it. Ha a lot of the energies have dissipated. But it's, there is tremendous disaffection with the global system, and we haven't found the right form for it. Um, certainly, you know these ongoing occupations of squares and all that. It's a form that was brilliant, but can't be. It couldn't be sustained. And uh, this and series of, and although the same people came from those movements to support series and think maybe left government would be the thing um, that would break the log jam and give people their power and you know we've seen the dynamic but we have to learn from all of that and find new forms and learn from that we we we, we need new forms i think left government has to be part of that I, I i believe in using the state as a lever of power but you know the crucial lesson lesson is not to allow um, leaders to demobilize, not to, not to allow your, ourselves to be demobilized by leaders that get seduced uh, in these closed rooms. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about um, the international movement. Um, and so I'm going to point to just two slides and they're um, slides that I'm happy about because they actually take yeah 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 and um, they take actually quotes from your book um, and so uh, the first one is uh, by a recently resigned uh, member of Syriza Central Committee um, and this is him speaking back in December 2012 he was speaking to an audience after I guess one of the one of the meetings um, and uh, it's something that I would hear often during that period from Syriza people when I was there, um, which is that basically, um, you know, Greece can't uh, do it on its own, um, and because no other country seems ready um, to put um, a party in power, let alone, uh, you know, pursue a more confrontational strategy that would include possibly breaking with the euro. Um, we uh, need to measure uh, what we're um, actually about to do. Uh, you can't have socialism in one country. That was repeated on and on and on. Um, and I think yet again that shows the leadership's, I mean, very understandable fears, but also, um, you know, uh, uh, refusal to uh, allow for the possibility of other lefts um, to to perhaps, if they deepen their own democratic debate, um, take on these questions. Um, and so I'm going to point um, and jump to uh, oops to ugh. yeah yeah. <laughs> um, to uh, a friend and comrade, Katrina Principe, who's also featured in the book, um, who, uh, when, um, you know, Bloco in Portugal, you know, uh, of who she's a member, um, ended up, you know, making um, some gains in the elections um, after Syriza's fall, um, spoke about um, Bloco's uh, internal discussion. Um, and there, um, I think brave step toward discussing, um, you know, the position of not one more sacrifice for the euro, um, and that for me is actually something that gives me hope in moving forward. Um, that there is actually a left in Europe um, that is taking seriously the lessons of Syriza, um, and I think that will be part of reconstituting. Um, you know, the anti-austerity movement throughout Europe. Uh, so that, that's, you know, what I can say for now, and we can return to this question. A few things about uh, the demobilization uh, issue that uh, you mentioned. I lived uh, for, I mean, I'm Greek, and I lived during those years in uh, Greece. 
and I witnessed a few things that I would like to share with you. Uh, for example, I mean, uh, Syriza participated in the, the movement of, uh, of the squares. Uh, but uh, what I had noticed over there was that uh, their aim was mainly to gather votes during those uh, struggles, which it was not to build a robust and uh, strong uh, movement. Uh, after the, 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 the movement of the squares uh, was dispersed, and we all moved uh, to the suburbs, to the neighborhoods where the police could not disperse us, and we were doing work still over there. I was participating in that, and I still I was watching that uh, every time that we were trying to do something uh, that would build up the movement, for example, organizing the unemployed, there was some, some, some impediment from uh, Syriza members. They are causing a fight or uh, causing a trouble, making people leave the, uh, the gatherings that uh, we were trying to, to establish something. Uh, also, I noticed that uh, during the referendum, uh, referendum in, uh, July, uh, in uh, July of uh, 2015, when everybody was uh, participating in the campaigning very enthusiastically, the series of members were rather reluctant. They were uh, sitting, uh, drinking coffee, discussing, not going out, uh, uh, distributing leaflets or things like that. So it seems to me that everything that came after that, the capitulation, was quite natural. It was not uh, a thunder in blue skies. It was quite natural. They never wanted to uh, contradict the European establishment. They were always looking for a compromise. The only thing that they wanted was the votes. Actually, I do remember in one of, I, I happened to live in a neighborhood in Athens where there were uh, prominent members of Syriza, like uh, Nikos Papas, like Gavril Sakellaridis, like Muzalas. And they had open gatherings. And I do remember the criticism of one Syriza member there, that uh, he was saying that we do see many movements coming up. And as a party, we do nothing. But uh, we just watch them until they disappear. That one, one of the criticisms that struck me at that, at that moment. But now everything uh, comes into part after I've seen all the things that I have seen. I do remember another time, uh, another member of uh, Syriza, that he was saying, she was saying actually, don't worry if one day we become PASOK. What we need is to, uh, to get the power now. That was the, yeah, that was the aim all the time. Just get the power, not build the movement. That's all. Exiting from the Euro um, uh, and, um, and uh, taking on uh, the European establishment uh, would, re uh, would require uh, much more um, perhaps than the kind of party Syriza was. I mean, um, and, and, you know, and I think we can see this in other countries too. Um, is, uh, because this organization, it seems to me, is aimed primarily at, um, at getting votes. It's primarily an electoral organization. Uh, but, but, to do, uh, to, but to conduct uh, the kind of mobilization that would be, be necessary uh, to defy the um, Troika, uh, the European institutions, you would, uh, you would need more uh, than uh, simply a party that is oriented toward elections. I think this has been proven not only in Greece, uh, but, but again and again it was proven in France in 1981, um, when uh, the, initial, uh, uh, the initial left Keynesian program of um, Mitterrand was defeated. Now it was proven in Chile, it's been proven in many places. So uh, it seems to me that you, um, it would require an organization uh, that more than aimed at getting votes, uh, would be uh, capable of conducting the kind of mass mobilization necessary, and that means penetrating into the workplaces, penetrating into the neighborhoods, uh, but doing work in defense of minorities, for instance, like the, um, the immigrants that were being harassed by the Golden Dawn in Greece. Uh, but so and, um, I don't think, uh, from what I can gather as an outside observer, uh, that Syriza was doing any of these things or um, 
act, or, or even wanted to do these things. In fact, uh, from what has just uh, been said, it was acting as an obstacle to it. So it raises the question of not only what kind of debate we need, but what kind of party is needed. I think we've heard a lot of critique about Ceres, and I imagine most of us are in agreement. But I hear very little about uh, what's going on with the left now in Greece. I just wanted to get some idea of uh, what, if anything, if there is any mobilization, if left is working together, or what is actually happening. I've read Helena's book and I strongly recommend it. I think it's a fantastic account for those of us who are paying attention over the period of time that it covers. Um, and I, I really actually disagree with the with the, uh, the previous speaker. I think there's a flattening of the historical account of Syriza to simply say that they're an electoral vehicle. Um, that tension existed for sure, but I think it misses something very important about the historical evolution of Syriza to simply dismiss it as an electoral uh, vehicle. I wanted to say just a couple things about the, the comparison with, with South Africa, because I think there's a, there's a reason there's a, in the, in the left imaginary in the West or in the US, in some ways they hold sim they can, they hold um, comparable positions at different particular moments, but I think that there's a danger in the in the comparison, Antina. Um, you know, the, the 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 transition, the negotiated settlement in the early 90s was just that—that that the negotiations happened early in the 1990s with Pickbota and 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 Tabo and Becky, and were specifically a negotiation to empower sections of the of the ANC, which was not a social democratic party in the first instance, and to disempower and to demobilize. Um, you know the 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 the, the ANC mass, and in many ways it succeeded in doing that. To, to whatever the illusions of of much of the much of the U.S. left had in 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 the ANC, and that's and that happens at the period of the beginning of the of, of the neoliberal period. So the comrades in the SACP would say in the in the in, in the early 90s that there was no alternative, that we have to walk this path, which I think was was disastrous, but. I think, and I'll end here, I mean, the other thing to think about is that South Africa retains an enormous level of social mobilization relative to, to other countries. And so the question isn't just one of social mobilization, but one, but, but also a question of, of, of political leadership and political organization around that social mobilization. Well, you've given a, a lot of the response that I would give to the first two speakers there. Um, I think that this account of series as only an electoral machine does flatten it out um, to be something that it wasn't in this period before 2015. It might be that now, uh, but it wasn't. You know, some people in series were like that. They fit your description. Uh, certainly the, the grouping around CPROS um, and the people that uh, adopted that position. But honestly, uh, you know, the people I've written about in this book, the people I know, were not like that. They were active in the trade unions, they were active in their communities, they were active in all kinds of prefigurative projects. Um, they, they've come to the, you know, the aid of refugees in a most impressive way. Um, I, I think that, um, that, that there's, there's hope that these forces will regather. Most of these people now who are the most impressive members of Syriza are no longer members of Syriza. And a lot of my hope for Greece is in ex-Syriza. And to answer your question about the Greek left and the state that it's in, um, it's very much in disarray. I mean, there still is mobilization and resistance, general strikes and pro constant protests all the time, constant protests. Um, that's the problem. Um, it's, 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 it's very diverse. There's cooperation between different groups, but it's, it just it hasn't found its next form yet. Uh, but it is searching for it. And, and there is hope there. The, uh, lots of people were mobilized and, and mobilized for something far beyond an electoral machine. And those energies are still there to be fashioned into something else. But people for the moment are a bit overwhelmed by defeat and depression and haven't, can't yet see how to do that. But the, the, you know, the possibilities are still there, I think. It's true uh, that there are differences um, in the parties um, and uh, yes, we should always be cautious in making 
historical comparisons, um, especially one in which I'm clustering, you know, a, a group that spans from the 90s through the 2010s and comparing it to one that spans, you know, two decades in the interwar and postwar period. Um, but uh, my understanding of the South African context is that the forces that did support um, the ANC um, uh, were pushing for a redistributive agenda um, that the leadership entertained and only formally dispensed with with its adoption of the growth and employment redistribution gear program in 96. Uh, and in that sense, I think we can characterize these as parties that um, were political representatives of mass mobilizations um, in the context of South Africa was actually of a national liberation movement. Um, in uh, Brazil, uh, for some time, it was actually um, a party operating under a dictatorship. Um, and in that sense, it was a, you know, a, a party of democratic consolidation as well. And in Greece, it was you know, more strictly um, a party leading um, politically the anti-austerity movements. Um, that for me is the upshot. They ended up politically leading um, these movements that had some kind of redistributive aim and whose participants felt that in supporting that party and taking power, they would be able to achieve some of those aims. Um, so of course, yes, in their party structures, um, even in the scope of their ambitions, um, their distinctions, but that's um, the basis on which I make that comparison. Um, I had you know, one more point. Did you have another question about that or that I didn't address, or that was the main question? By way of preface that I quite liked uh, Helen, Helena's book. Um, I too uh, ex went through many of these experiences in Greece and I wrote and published my own book about them. Uh, I have some, some political differences with Helena, but uh, I did appreciate the, uh, her uh, very frank uh, writing and, uh, and that she tried to make it a, a very personal, which I thought was very good. Um, but on the question of Syriza, I agree that it was not simply an electoral machine, but what, 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 it, what was it not? It was not a revolutionary party. It, was not a rev it, it, it did not aspire to lead a revolution. And this goes as much for the left in Syriza as for anyone else. There was a very famous interview in Jacobin magazine that Lapovitsas gave, in which he said, yes, I'd love to have socialism, but it's not on the table. It's not on the table in any time in, uh, in the near future. So the best we could hope for, and then he outlined his plan, which he called Plan B for an exit from the Euro and some kind of revival of native Greek capitalism. Uh, I wrote a reply to Lapovitsis and I sent it to Jacobin. They ignored it. I called my reply Plan C. Plan C was a transition to socialism. And, uh, and of course, uh, one must recognize that uh, there's no uh, socialism in Greece by itself is, is a figment of a bad imagination, but Greece could have certainly led the way for uh, a, a socialist uh, movement throughout Europe. Uh, there were forces looking to Greece at that time for some kind of leadership and uh, well we know what happened. What happened was a total disaster and the outcome of it is yes uh, severe demoralization. Uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think that in any sense the working class in Greece has been defeated historically. I think they will rise again and I think there's, there's still much, much uh, fighting power there but uh, th those lessons really have to be absorbed. I think, I think it's just uh, unfortunate that no one raises the question of socialism as the alternative both to the European Union and to some kind of uh, exit from the Euro uh, and uh, sustaining oneself under some kind of native capitalism. What's, what's your book? It's here. What's the name of it? Uh, you can have a copy. Oh, thank you. One of the things that distinguished the South African experience from the Greek experience, it seemed to me, 
was the absence in the left effort in Greece of the Greek Communist Party. Um, did you think, or does anybody think that the, had they been present, they would have had more weight to a left view that the the decision to absent to to abstain uh, w could have changed this. You're talking about the EU as a as a mobilized uh, force of global capital, which was able to a combination of seduce and and crush uh, national forms of of the left. In the last year or two, there have been opposition to or um, the EU has manifested itself many, many places all over Europe. Is there any move to uh, bring that opposition um, together as some kind of a force to, to overcome the national isolation? Uh, that the EU is able to crush. I seem to remember that there were lots of self-help, cooperative, uh, uh, civil society, self-organization efforts, at which seems to me to be the base, you know, even, you know, it's not a full economy, but it's the basis of people knowing each other, staying connected, and being the, uh, the uh, fabric upon which something new can arise. I wonder whether people who are unemployed uh, and yet there are these resources lying around, uh, 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 clinics and so forth, uh, whether any of this is still working and is a base for some resurgence of uh, hope. Let me come in with a question, which is what is happening with the Greek right? I mean, building on Gary's comment, unfortunately, so much of the criticism of the EU is taking very right-wing forms. And so how is that playing out in the, the Greek context? OK, there's a lot there. Um, I'll give short answers to what questions that really need very long answers. Um, about um, the thesis, which I guess is in your book, and about the series of not being a revolutionary party. The aim of Syriza was socialism and to find a meaningful way in the 21st century to go from capitalism to socialism in what needed to be a very protracted process. That was Syriza's declared aim. That was the sincere aim of many people I knew in Syriza. Even some of the people who betrayed that once did believe it. Um, so uh, again, it's the question of whether it was just an electoral machine or something else. But it, and, and this was my attraction to Syriza, that they were opening a new path to get from capitalism to socialism in these much more complicated times of ours, where there's the, you know, uh, the whole power of financial capital on a global scale. Um, I thought that they were setting out a new trajectory for all of us and that, but the aim was socialism. Um, about, um, Oh, Daniel, uh, yes, my answer to that is just yes. <laughs> I do believe that um, if the Greek Communist Party, the Kukue, had a different attitude to Syriza and were an integral part of the process, that things would have unfolded in a very different way. And I, I mean, they're a very formidable party. Um, with, and there are many positive things that could be said about them. But their attitude to the other forces of the left is indefensible. And I think that, that they, you know, do bear a lot of responsibility for what happened. I do. Um, about the EU, it's very volatile. It's also very complicated because the right and the left are on both sides of this debate about the EU. Um, I believe that we need an international public sector, which is what the EU is supposed to be, as, as opposed to an instrument uh, for bearing down um, on public, uh, public enterprise, the whole public sector in the interests of private capital, which is the way the EU actually works. But it's the opposite of, of you know, what uh, an international body that's in that space should be. I think we do need something in that space. 
and I see the EU as a site of struggle. But the problem is what class forces dominate the EU. It's the same problem as we have in our nation states. Um, you know, what class forces dominate, and we have to find a way to address that. Um, about civil society, um, these projects are still there. Um, they're, they're kind of demoralized, but they are continuing. Um, there, there are many, many projects um, for uh, socialized, you know, uh, help to address needs uh, for food, for health care. It's, you know, that network is still there. Uh, and, and yes, it's, it's a grounds for hope. But the problem about it is um, you can keep building, building, building from below. And I do believe that should be a crucial part of the whole strategy of the left to do that. But at the same time, there is the problem of scalability. There is the problem of expropriating the expropriators. So much power and wealth has been taken from us. And to just build from below with what resources we can get without finding a way to take that power and wealth from them and redistribute it to us. And that is a real problem. In the, to how to do that in the 21st century. It's not like, you know, there are these miners in the mine and they have their little hovels and the mine owner lives on the hill and you could imagine what it would be like to seize the mine to take the mine owner's house. It's, it's not so easy to imagine that and to know how to do it in 21st century capitalism, but that's the way we have to be thinking. Um, so it's grounds for hope but it's and it's, it's a way that we have to go but we also have to address the you know the power and wealth from above um, about um, the Greek right um, the, the far Greek right golden dawn is static at the moment thankfully it's 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 not growing it, it, it could, but it's not for the moment. The more traditional Greek right, neo-democracy is rising in the polls. And, you know, if there were an election now, Syriza would lose and they would win. Uh, not, they couldn't rule on their own, but they would put together a coalition uh, with Pasok, Potomi, and, you know, so, you know, that right is still there. And, and just in the absence, just because of the defeat of Syriza and the fact that the left hasn't been able to put forward a convincing alternative to Syriza, although I'm very close to the people that left Syriza that are trying to do that, they're not thriving at the moment. Um, so yet the traditional right is, is rising in the polls and probably will win the next election. So I very much agree with your point that that is the key question for anti-capitalist strategy today. How do you expropriate expropriators who operate on a global level, but who also express their class power domestically, which is, you know, what I would point out in my response to you. Syriza was not just contending with its foreign lenders, but also um, with the key sectors that, um, you know, constitute the Greek ruling class, which um, are located in the shipping, media, and finance sectors. Um, and given the latter in particular, their integration in the European banking system, for Syriza to have pursued a confrontational strategy, it would have been an all-out war, both domestically and uh, with their international lenders, which, of course, is um, why they needed to have prepared for an exit on concrete um, sectoral class terms. Um, and in that respect, I agreed full-heartedly with Lapavitsa's attempts um, to forge one and think that had there been a party process for deepening that, um, the left wing of Syriza would have been able to present um, an alternative that could have moved an even wider section of the population. Uh, and I'll just say something very brief um, about the question about solidarity networks, which is that, yes, they you know, are not just sputtering along, but in some cases growing. Um, but they're not growing in the way that I think they would have had we had that confrontational, perhaps default scenario. In Argentina, when the Red Detroit network, which is the alternative currency network, expanded, it was after the default, and it grew, you know, from, you know, maybe 10,000 to millions of participants within months. Um, 
And I remember talking to a friend, uh, this was maybe August 2015, thinking, you know, why haven't we seen uh, a parallel expansion? And she's like, well, clearly the determinant factor was the default. It would have been that um, triggering moment. Um, and it's all the more reason that the capitulation was tragic because people were trying to build the infrastructure uh, potentially that would have complemented then, you know, uh, on a policy level, the developmental plans that the state could have pushed through.